Hello and welcome to the Rest is Entertainment Questions Edition with me, Marina Hyde. And me, Rich Dawson. Welcome to the Question and Answers Edition. Um, hey, Marina, how are you? I'm very well. Yet again, the questions have been terrific. There's some really funny ones and some really intriguing ones. I think we have my favourite question of all time coming up later. And it was both of ours when we saw it, so <laughs> yes. Shall we start with this? It is a question from Sally Ward. Thank you, Sally. She has three children. She says, over the years, I've been really impressed with the amount of storyline, humour and drama that children's TV writers are able to include in a five or ten minute slot, e.g. Ben and Holly's Little Kingdom, Danger Mouse, etc. I feel these writers have a tough job to pack so much into that small slot. Her question is, do you think children's TV writers get the respect they deserve from the industry? That is a terrific question. I also love children's TV and having watched a lot of it in when I was young, obviously, but also when <laughs> I've had three children who are still quite small, things like Hey Dougie, Bluey, I mean, Abney and Teal, which I absolutely loved. What's it called? Abney and Teal. Oh, my God, it's absolutely terrific. And the people who did things like In the Night... There's one guy, a guy called Andrew Davenport, who did mm. Teletubbies, In the Night Garden, Moon and Me... Russell T. Davis said he think who's obviously our, one of our greatest living television writers, said, I actually think that Andrew Davenport it should be considered in the same breath as Tom Stoppard and Samuel Beckett. First of all, you're so right about the concision required for that type of writing. And I always think if you're made to write something short, yep. you become a really good writer. I, this is the advice whenever people ask me about journalism, I always just say... Write really small things. Write something in 500 I thought, words. I you meant write really small. <laughs> write really Honestly, small. write really, tiny really writing. tiny writing. Then see if you can write it in 250 words. Then see if yeah. you can write in 100 words. And you will not waste a word. They do not waste a word in Hey Doggy, in Bluey. There's so much plot in five minutes. I mean, there's a lot of plot in five minutes of Peppa Pig. It's extraordinary how they do it. And if everyone knew that, then you wouldn't be sitting there sometimes when you're watching something on some one of the streamers thinking, Jesus Christ, nothing's happened for tw nothing yeah. has happened for 25 minutes. We've got nine episodes of this. This is so indulgent. It's so indulgent. Now, yeah, children's television on, has... Come, come on, Laura Dern, shoot someone. Yeah. <laughs> and also the, the people who work on these things, like Adrian Scarborough, an actor mm. I pay a fortune to watch in the theatre and have done on many occasions. He's in, so he does the voiceover at Abney and Teal. A lot of really amazing writers, Russell T. Davis being one among them, started in children's television. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes ITV isn't making children's television themselves yep. anymore, which is a great sort of sadness. And, um, I mean, I, it is the best training ground in lots of ways. And lots of brilliant comedy writers uh, start out on those shows as well. Yeah. Pingu is brilliantly funny. It's, yeah. it's, it's such a great way to get into the industry. And there is, and again, it's, it's the, you know, the short form versions of it do sort of mean it's perfect for our culture. And some of the biggest YouTube channels are, are you know, kids things as well i started years and years ago i used to write with david williams when he was david williams and the first thing we ever did was i think called i hate this house which is on cbbc I remember that. yeah uh, and you know we got into it via there and so do, so many writers get their first break just writing little short things for for children's tv um you know really properly funny people but that's no, great bluey is like one of the bluey great phenomenons terrific, of the world right? but it's interesting that sally identifies the concision, because yeah. I think that is such a good way of becoming a good writer at anything, is to be able to write short before you do whatever people now think of, of as long form. And a lot of long form journalism is just long. It is not long yeah. form journalism. It's just the Internet has given people an infinite space and they have lost the art of concision. And I really think that certainly on television, they've learned to write short. Yeah. I say to anyone writing books as well, if you're editing a scene, lose the first four paragraphs. Yeah. You know, come in as late as possible. Always, always come, come in, in as late as possible and come out as early as possible. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people will just keep on reading to the next chapter and the next chapter. But, yeah, Kids TV, Sally, you're absolutely right. Genuinely, it's 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 an, it's an underappreciated treasure and has been for many, many years. But if you get it right, uh, incredibly lucrative. <laughs> I've got one, OK, from Sean Freeman, Richard. I wondered about multi-camera shows such as Gladiators, which aren't transmitted live. Would a director select camera shots as live during the events or would they cut footage together later? The answer is both. So if you're making Gladiators, you know the shots that you want. You probably, I don't know how many cameras they'd have on that. But even on a panel show, you've got six or seven cameras. They've got a lot of cameras because yeah. they have so many reactions. And they've got lots of fixed rig cameras yeah. and, and all sorts of things. So... A director knows roughly what's going to happen. They've done rehearsals, so he knows what a game is like. He knows they're going to go from Bradley at the beginning and then they're going to go up onto the podium and then there's going to be a fight and then one of them's going to fall down and then there's going to be another interview. So he's got yeah. a rough idea of the geography of what's happening. He sits next to someone called a vision mixer and the vision mixer has the output of all of the cameras 
And that's when the director's working out that camera four, which has got to get the big high shot, it actually needs to go to the left because you're missing something there. So the director is constantly working out where those cameras are pointed. The vision mixer is doing a live cut of the show as it goes along. So roughly what you would be watching on TV is what the vision mixer does. But then all of that footage goes into the edit. So you've got that, that master, which is the, the vision mixer is put together with, you know, the director calling out various shots. Um, so, you know, if Jewel is taking place uh, and you need to cut three seconds out of it, that's an edit. And the edit, of course, you've got to go to a different camera shot. So when you're in the edit, you've got all the footage from all those different cameras. You've got your sort of master, which has been cut in the studio, yeah. and you drop in fun reaction shots from the audience or, you know, if there's a brilliant reaction shot from one of the gladiators. So you're always looking for interesting shots which weren't put into the um, cut in the studio. So it's an incredibly time-consuming um process that funnily enough we talked about ai last week i was talking to a very big entertainment producer and i said what in entertainment where where's the first place we're going to see ai really make an impact he said the edit he said the edit ai will be able to sort of drop in all of those shots that you want almost instantaneously so that first cut of a show is going to be done incredibly quickly. God, so, I remember people saying right back in the you know when X Factor or whatever was in its absolute pomp, and it was you know you were almost watching something created by the sort of karaoke Lenny Reefin yeah. style. And he had <laughs> Cowell had each quarter of that show had fo- had its own edit because it was he he was so you know the the milking of emotion. This is why yeah. I bring in Lenny Reefin style. The the sort of dealing with the, the trying to make it tug on every nation's heartstrings, everyone to react in exactly way, the way he was managing them into yeah, reacting. Yeah. It was so much work that each each 15 minutes of the show had its entire own edit team. Yeah, and that, by the way, I don't like. I think that way of doing stuff got found out. You would see reactions yeah. on that show which you n- knew were not the reactions to what happened. Absolutely. And a decent show will... You, you, you'll, you'll be watching through the master uh, and then on your other screens you've got all the other cameras showing exactly what happened at that time. So you can put in the reaction of what happened at that time. But they would consciously choose shots from different parts of the show and put it in like sometimes they do things like on you know x Red or britain's got talent where there's silence in the hall you think someone's come on they're so bad everyone's silent you think but of course they weren't it was absolute nonsense and you know they would edit things in 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 a way that, that i i thought was uh cheating the viewer but yeah by and large the vision mixer and the director shoot as live cut it as as well as they can live and then an editor has an incredibly tough job of patching that all together you know putting their music on putting the dub you know all all of that uh kind of stuff but it's a real treat to see a great editor at work and it's an unbelievable treat to see a director and vision mixer at work together the speed they work at and the director talking to all the different camera operators also who are brilliant and getting different shots and then being cut up live in a in a a gallery it's it's a it's a it's a real art here's a question for you marina it's from henry no Hello, surname. Henry. He probably does have a surname. He might not. He's declined but, to include it in this case. You know what? He's like Madonna. <laughs> just he's so big. He's Where, the only Henry. Wherever he lives, like in Ryslip, he's so big. People just go, yeah, Henry. Okay, now tell me what he's asking. Uh, Henry says... Oh, he, nothing. Nothing. Uh, no. <laughs> just... <laughs> Henry says, you often refer to a third act in movies, uh, although it may apply to other formats. What is the third act and why is it so important? A three-act structure is a sort of really traditional but a satisfying way of telling a story. So in the most traditional sense, you would have the setup, act one, a sort of confrontation struggle, act two, and third act is the resolution. So when we talk about why the third act, if we don't like the third act, it's a bit of a problem because it's Mm. the tying up of the film. Um, So so first act... We meet people, we see where we are, yeah, we see what the situation is. People have done interesting things with this, like famously the sort of Hollywood producers, Don Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer in the 80s um, with their sort of high concept movies really refined and pushed this structure so it was you can almost physically feel it happening. You've got like in a very hot first act, um, then a second act with a crisis and a third act with kind of redemption via triumph and probably in the case of their movies like, I don't know, 
Top Gun, uh, Days of Thunder, Flash Dance, a freeze frame ending. And oh. it was really, some people, it's so ingrained in them. My late father in law was a filmmaker and he, um, used to say to my husband when he was really small, when they were watching, just when they were watching a movie together and you just they'd be sitting there and he'd go, oh, end of Act One. <laughs> and so it, it, my husband's sort of understanding of story kind of grammar, really, mm. it, it's almost instinctive. And it is, a, as I say, it's a satisfying way of telling a story. And by the way, this can a, a, apply to an episode of lifestyle programming. Yeah. You can yes. you can tell any stories in these ways. And so, grand designs. Has, grand designs has is. Classic, I was about to yeah, say is a, the real three act structure. Yeah, which and, is here's here's a wreck. Uh, oh no, they're pregnant and the and the uh, the windows haven't arrived. Let's take a look at this lovely house. First uh, act, second but act. But sometimes, third act. Richard. Sometimes it ends in tragedy because that Occasionally. happens. Yeah, listen, tragedy does happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But as I, yeah, anything, even factual programming can be di- can be divided like this. But it is a satisfying way to tell a story. And so when things are, and sitcoms, everything, when things have problems in the third act, it is obviously particularly problematic because that is the resolution of the story. And a lot of things kind of can lose their way, I think, in the third act. Also, because books also by and large have three acts. I certainly always yeah. write. You never consciously do, but I think there's the setup. Here's the business. Here's the conclusion. But I'm quite good with Act 1 and Act 3. But Act 2 is one sometimes you think, OK, I've, I, I know where we are, I know the situation, I know the characters, I know where we're going to end up and there's this big sort of set pc type thing. And they think, ah, oh, there's 50,000 words in between those two things. And that's where the fun of writing comes, is sort of working your way through that second act. But, yeah, but once you sort of know that structure, you see it absolutely... Yeah, Everywhere. it's a good way of testing yourself as a writer. The um, brilliant TV writer, Brian Fuller, who did sort of Hannibal, who's done lots of Star Trek. He's an amazing TV writer, really kind of eccentric genius. And he uh, said to me once that, oh, yeah, if I ever I've got a way of that, I think with Act 3 would end, I always say, right, I'll take that and I'll put it at the end of Act 1. And then now I've got to, it, because yeah, it makes you, you yeah, instead of thinking, oh, that's how it's going to end, he'll make that at the end of Act 1. And then you kind of, you're getting deeper into it already. And so that's it's a way people can kind of play around with it a lot to kind of test themselves and to, and to challenge themselves. Well, that's it. Say, once, once, once you know the rules, you can, you can yeah. play about with them. But, uh, but also it's worth saying that in, in these sort of big sort of multi-series things, that there's all sorts of different structures going on. And also with, you know, shows that have advertising breaks necessarily have to have a slightly different structure than shows without yeah, advertising breaks. you need to have breaks. something exciting before yeah. the break. Shakespeare used to have five-act plots... Did yeah, not? yeah. There, are, there, there are all many different ways. But actually, if you stand right back from the story and think about it, you'll see that there's, um, you know, there's been a set up, then there's been a problem and then there's been a resolution. And yeah. almost all stories work, even if they're happy, sad, whatever, will work in that sort of a way if they're satisfying. Yeah. Couple meets, couple splits up, couple gets back together. <laughs> there you go. Only you can answer this, Richard. Steve Parrott says, on Pointless, do the winners get a trophy each? Do you know what my favourite thing about this podcast is? We go from the entire future of humanity with AI to do people on Pointless get a a trophy each. And also, I know which segment is more interesting to people, and it's this one. Um, Yes, they do get a trophy each, and, I mean, it would be crazy if they didn't. I guess sometimes people have been on Pointless celebrities have got more than one trophy each. I think Sean Williamson has four. Um, he, wow. that's a guy with a lot of downstairs bathrooms. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they do get a trophy each. How big is the point of this trophy? It is surprisingly small. However, it is bulky. It's proper cut glass. I mean, you could and definitely... And in terms of what it means, it's an, oh, essentially uh, unscalable. It's enormous. It is the single most coveted trophy in yeah. the history of television. We it, That's the interesting thing with TV shows. I, it, obviously, in the very first script, it said the coveted point this trophy, and I don't think they've ever changed... That script so yeah. is the coveted pointless trophy. But yeah, it's got sharp edges, it's heavy, you could definitely it's a proper murder weapon. Awards surely are all just all murder weapons. I mean look at an Emmy, that could take you out. I, no uh, funny enough, in my new book We Solve Murders, yeah. out, out in the shops in September, but, but you can uh, pre-order now. available to pre-order, an award is used as a weapon. <gasps> How about that? That's a world exclusive. Very yeah. exciting. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Because if you've ever, and and anyone it's... you're ever holding, you're thinking this is simply the sharpest and most dangerous and pointlessly heavy thing that there is. Yeah. So that's spoken to someone who's held a lot of awards. I mean, I, <laughs> no. um, but yeah, so you get, uh, yeah, you get one each, but you only get half the money. So, you know. 
That's showbiz. Yeah, that, <laughs> it really is showbiz. But yeah, they light it from like it's a monolith, like it's the Statue of Liberty. They put it on a plinth and turn it round. That's the shot they always show. So I think when people first see it, they think that's not as big as I think it would be. But then I think they'd rather like it. Yeah. Don't clip that bit out and put that on TikTok. <laughs> Come on, guys, play fair. Uh, question here from Jason Swaby. He says the gaming industry is expected to generate over $170 billion this year, five times greater than that of worldwide movie box office revenues. At what point do you think the video game industry will be taken seriously by non-gamers and recognised as culturally important and as significant as the film and music industries? Yeah, you're right, Jason. It's ahead of movies and music, I think, but it's behind TV and streaming. I think people sort of recognise it as a fact of commercial and business life. Like it's like the sort of... I don't know, the marketing industry or the precious metals industry or something, that it's a big industry on that sort of... But they don't think of it culturally. It's interesting. I think that it wasn't taken seriously for a long time, clearly. Criticism is always an interesting part of it, is that cr critics have been a big part of making, you know... A big part of making the new Hollywood was Pauline Kyle, the kind of amazing film critic who brought all these filmmakers to people's attention. This is, I'm just going back to the 1970s. And she kind of created a different way of talking about movies. And it, things were taken much more seriously than they had been necessarily before. The gaming industry has been relatively resistant to criticism in some ways, I think. And if you look at things like Gamergate um, and these kind of big, horrible kind of online pylon scandal things, there is something quite gatekeepery about that as an industry and that, that shuts people out. Also, industries need stars to become mega mm. um, in, in that cultural mega way. And you notice that all the people who do, I don't know, voiceovers for games, things like that, they're actors. They're coming in from another industry. So the sense of, obviously you'll get this, some of the kind of games houses and the people who make the games, people think of them as kind of enormous, but they're like a brand. They're like Disney. In terms of stars, tell me who its stars are. Industries need stars to become, that, that kind of cultural industry needs a star to become enormous. Three words. Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's a... I mean, that's the thing, is they punch massively above their weight. Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto, these things are multi, multi, multi-billion franchises. Some of the biggest cultural icons of our time, Mario, Sonic, the Mario movie was beyond massive. You know, Legend of Zelda is enormous. Minecraft is massive. Yeah, but I think perhaps because video games came of age slightly after that era where we had this shared mass culture, yeah. they've always existed. They've always been slightly siloed off. You know, we grew up with television where everyone watched the same thing, and so television became a massive cultural conversation. And video games, which are beyond huge and affect everything we do, affect all the movies we make. Completely I, and, yeah. and, a, and a culturally and, and artistically incredible in oh. many, many ways. I mean, something like Grand Theft Auto, you just think I mean, this is one of the greatest works of art I've ever seen in my entire life. The and they work... always regarded their competition as movies and not um, and, and, and not other games. They, yeah. but they But they put themselves against that to say, these are who we compete with. But I think to, to answer the question, I think that they don't have the same cultural cut through because of when they came of age i suspect i'm not sure any industry will ever have that cultural cut through again but they they seem to be doing all right without it the first ever show i ever ever worked on was a show called games world on sky which is five times a week half hour oh my god it's bad uh, but you know <laughs> in the early days you know that yeah. was you know when with sega mega drive and all that kind of stuff uh, and uh, television has never really done video games brilliantly no is the truth but it's it's its its own world it's its own culture um so but i suspect if you're waiting for it to become a lingua franca that probably isn't going to happen our favorite question ever colin skivington when a character in a tv show or film throws something into a river or the sea are the production team obliged to retrieve it or do they get permission or just do it anyway I remember an episode of Luther where Idris Elba threw something into the Thames and I thought, surely you can't do that. <laughs> Colin, epic, thank you. That is, yeah, I mean, genuinely, I hadn't thought about it before. I'm not sure I have an answer to this one. I, I wanted the question read out because I wanted Colin's brain to be represented uh, on the show. But yeah, when someone throws something into, a, into the sea or river... Um, 
What I happens asked, next, Marina? I have asked props back experts about have this. You? Okay. Great. So first of all, they would like to say that the things that go into the water are normally duplicates. So if you see someone chuck their phone into the sea or something like that, it is often a rubber duplicate. It's not unless could, unless you're Rebecca Vardy. Unless you're in le, her, the agent, please. Oh, sorry. Unless you're Rebecca and Vardy's you're just agent. On a classic wag holiday destination, yeah. the North Sea. <laughs> Uh, anyway, if you, if a car goes in, it's had its engine, any oil, anything else like that removed, it has to have before it goes in, and obviously they have to retrieve that. Oh. Some things degrade if it's photographs or paper, you know people chucking a photograph into the sea. You can see kind of you you know this kind of visual lexicon of shots. Oh, like someone on the back of a ferry just tearing up like a wedding photo, yeah, and just throwing it over into the, the side. Wake. Whoa. Yeah, we've seen that many times. They don't I'll, have to I'll go. level with you, Richard. That doesn't get retrieved. <laughs> it's not like eight divers going down. Off the record, but you know, or anonymously, props people will say the only time they retrieve them is if they float because they've got to go for another take. <laughs> And it's there standing there. It's like, well, there's already a load of pictures in this sea. Oh, oh so, yeah, of course. So someone yeah. has got to go on a, often on a small boat with a pool skimmer and get it out so that the next phone or you know, rubber phone or photographs or whatever can go in. And if Who's it doesn't sink... Who's throwing something they float that floats? Well, I mean, photos float. You've just described a situation where you rip up the photo and, you know, that will float. Someone's got to go in and then they've got another photo of her that's going to get ripped up again. They might do it ten times, you see. So you need the pool skimmer, you need the guy in the boat, or it might be a lady. If I was the director, I'd say, you know what, actually throw it in the bin. <laughs> Actually, just 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 put it in the bin. But there are a lot of props at the bottom of sea and uh, of river that have simply not been retrieved because you're not going to get a diver to go down there to get, you know, the phone, the rubber phone that you've thrown in. If they ever send divers down there, they'd be able to arm a small country. It's like a, a lake full of golf balls on a provincial golf course. <laughs> yes. Um, but... Colin, th that's such a great question, and I love the fact that you had the answer to it as well. I will never see anyone... I had to ask props people for this. <laughs> yeah, but listen, that's uh, <laughs> given their props. I'm struggling to remember ever seeing anyone throw something into the sea. I'm not sure I've seen the Oh, God, I have. No, you have. Really? Oh, every really? come on. Wedding rings, uh, photos. Yes, definitely. Things off the end of a pier. How many times? Bodies. Yeah, bo yeah I've seen that. Sure. They have to recover those. Yeah. They have to recover those. One, yeah, it's just this. Yes, I'm do. assuming those poor actors. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm so going to keep an eye out for that. The next time there's like a big drama where someone throws something into the sea, everyone is going to remember this episode and remember the name Colin Skivington. Colin, thank you so much. Thank you very much. More in this vein, please. And if you do want to send questions in, there are so many incredible ones which we'll be getting round to. Um, they, it, the address is the rest is entertainment at gmail .com, and we have a huge repository of questions. But please add to it. There's a question that I really wanted to get to this week, but I think we've run out of time. But we'll do next week, which is what is the biggest waste of time meeting you've ever had? <laughs> Yes, please. That's okay. good, right? Tune in next week. I'll give you a week to think about that one. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for listening, everyone. We'll see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.